<laughs> All right, let's continue through some slides, and uh, then we will finish off the lab. Uh, make sure that I leave you 30 minutes or so to work on the lab at least, okay? Sometimes I get to talk in and I forget what time it is. Actually, is that clock right? Yeah, it is right. So I, I should be able to watch it. Anyway. All right, so uh, PLCs, applications and size. Um, the way you categorize a PLC does depend on several different things. How it operates, how many inputs and outputs it has, what size it is, all those things make a difference. And I.O. is probably the most important size factor. It basically tells you how many input points and how many outputs you have. And so if you, if you, a micro PLC is 15 to 128 I.O. points. Medium is 128 to 512, and large is over 512 input output points. So it's kind of just a, a rough breakdown on PLC size. Do you think there are any PLCs that have more than 512 outputs or input outputs? Oh, yeah, there are. There was a time I was uh, at a, a class, and it was a class called Quality Control, one of the most boring and yet valuable classes I think I've ever taught. I was bored teaching it. I can't imagine how the students felt. But yet I've been in industry, and so I knew how important all this stuff was. Getting across the importance of it, to, of it though, was difficult. So I decided to take the, the students on a field trip. All right, why not? When, when in doubt, take them on a field trip. <laughs> at least you'll get to see something real. Then. So I had a friend over at GE, and I said, yeah, I'd, I'd like to tour GE. So they got me a tour and took our it's the GE Appliance Park. So all these students and I went over. And I had had these students in machine elements. So they had had the size of being, well, and the strength of materials. So they had, no, they knew about st standard structural shapes, and they knew there were I beams that were tall. And you know, you, they, you know, a lot of times these students would calculate an I beam that was a foot tall and say, "Man, that's a that's a heck of an I beam, right?" I, anybody really use something that big? I mean, if you look at the frame of the building going up out here, even those I beams that are the uprights are maybe a foot, probably a little less. So it seems like an excessive size. And then, you know, I also had these students in controls. And I'd shown them PLCs, and they seemed to be of the opinion, well, why would I need more than 20 inputs, output points? You know, that's what we have on these PLCs, and we've succeeded so far, so why would I need more? Well, it was really nice to be able to take them over to that appliance park. At the appliance park, we toured, and that's a huge place. You can't even tour it all in one day, okay? We toured only one section of it. We toured the washing machine line, so the dishwashing machine line. I'm sorry, not the clothes washer, but the dishwasher. And so we got to see how it was put together on an assembly line and got to see some of the quality control stuff. That's why we were there. But along the way, we also saw the injection molding, I won't say machine, I'll say monster, <laughs> that injection molds the, the bulk of the machine. So it's the, the, the body, right? The, the, they, they injection mold it all in one piece so that they can eliminate leaks. You don't want to make a top, left, right, back, and bottom, and then weld them together, plastic weld them. That's a bad idea because you'll end up with leaks. So they injection mold all of it. Now, of course, there's, there's holes in it for pumps and things like that, drains and so on. But you want to control where they are, and you don't want seams to come apart. Right? What happens when you've got a million dishwashers out there, and customers start complaining because they're cracking at the seams and flooding their homes and destroying their homes? Right? You're out of business at that point. At least you, you hope you get to go out of business without them taking something out of your hide, okay? So anyway, so they injection molded. The, now imagine, that's a pretty decent sized plastic part. At least this wide, so tall, you know, roughly three foot dimensions in every direction. And all one piece without, of course, a front on it. And so the machine for doing this was absolutely huge. These tables here in the center, that was about the footprint of the mold itself. The mold went from the floor to the ceiling of this room, and that was basically solid steel. Multiple parts, right, that moved. I can't imagine how much this thing weighed, okay? Uh, above it was an I-beam that they used, because sometimes you got to lift this mold out of place. Guess how tall that I-beam was? Not long. It was probably a couple hundred foot long. Guess how tall it was? Three foot. Three foot tall. This was a huge I-beam. Can you imagine? That makes sense, right? That's a lot of weight to pick up. Of course, you need something very strong. You know what was controlling this big behemoth, though? A PLC. A PLC. Sitting right on the side, lights flashing. There were probably 20 different modules in this thing. It was The PLC had to be this long. It was huge. And, of course, you saw lights blinking and flashing like crazy. And the students were looking at it like, wow, all that stuff told us is true. Look at all this stuff. Yeah. Forget quality control at that point. They were just blown away that... They'd actually learned something in class, you know. 
Anyway, um, oh man, <laughs> well you know all this stuff is actually you. Anyway, um, so choosing the right PLC and matching it to the application is is a very important point. But one thing you'll find is, like I said, if you think you know know how many inputs and outputs you need, go ahead and double it at least to save your skin later. Okay. Now there's a couple different ways that PLCs are typically used. One is called single-ended multitask and then control management. I'll show you in a, a second what all those are. But single-ended single -ended is the basic one. It's the one you probably think of default. And it's basically the one where the one PLC controls one process. It's, it's the brain of the machine and that's pretty much it. You might communicate with other things for giving information around, but one PLC controls one machine or one process. A multitask PLC is where one PLC is made to control several processes. So possibly several different machines are controlled by one PLC. Okay. Now, one of the problems with this is if you've got a one PLC that's supposed to control multiple multiple machines, you're going to end up with a whole lot of input and output points. Okay. So you've got to have a big PLC. You can see we've got on this one one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Looks to me like there's no. I take that back. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven populated slots and room for expansion in the count of about five or so. Okay, so this is a, a PLC where it's controlling multiple machines at one time. Control management PLCs are PLCs that basically talk to other control devices and tell them what they need. Does that make sense? Kind of like a supervisor, if you will. So that's a control management PLC. Um, so those are three different ways. What we're going to look at in this class is Primarily the single ended, right? It's the easiest thing to look at. Uh, memory is something that's important, and what you'll notice is that the memory in a PLC, the first thing you'll probably notice is that the memory amount in a typical PLC is probably less than the amount of memory in your pocket in your cell phone. Okay? That's just reality. You don't need a ton of memory. These programs aren't that compli complicated typically. Uh, but they're usually expressed in either kilobytes or megabytes. So you have 1K, 6K, and 12K are not common. They're usually in multiples of two, so one kilobyte, eight kilobytes, 16 kilobytes would be more common, but today memory is more in the megabyte range because memory is very cheap and inexpensive. In fact, <laughs> you guys might laugh. I have an old computer that I use. This old computer runs Ubuntu, okay, which is a Linux distribution. And I use it mainly because I trust Linux with my files much more than I trust Windows with my files. Okay? That's why I did it, because I found out about this filing system called the ZFS filing system. I don't remember what it stands for. Basically, it has a bunch of stuff built into it. It has error checking, it has error correction. It's a very bulletproof file system. I've got tons of pictures of my daughter as she's growing up, and I thought, you know, I really don't want to lose these. I want these backed up somewhere or in a storage medium where it won't go bad, right? And so I've got all these. I ended up buying two separate two terabyte hard drives, put them in the computer and have them mirrored, right? So if one hard drive goes down, everything's still there on the other one. Uh, it saved my bacon a couple of times already. I'm really happy I've done this. But I use an older computer for it, and the Ubuntu version I use runs just fine on it. And the other day, I was having trouble with this machine. I was doing just crazy stuff. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with MemTest86. That's a common program that you use to test computer memory. A lot of times when your computer is messing up, it's because your memory has gone bad. Your, your RAM has gone bad. And so, uh, of course, me using old computers with used components, I get that a little more frequently than probably if I'd spend a little money on it. But anyway, I was having all these troubles and ran MemTest86. Sure enough, one of my 512 megabyte DIMMs had gone bad. You probably can't even buy a 512 megabyte DIMM anymore. But anyway, I had one gig and two 512 meg uh, DIMMs. So I had what, two gigabytes total in this machine. And it has four slots, and I thought, well, you know, why don't I just look and see what it would cost to buy? Normally I don't buy things like this. I use used stuff, but I thought, I don't even want to bother going down to my basement, looking through all the old junk I've got, and trying to find this particular flavor of memory. So I'm going to look on eBay and see what it costs. Guess how much I had to pay to get four gigabytes of RAM to upgrade that computer to its full capacity? $8. You got it. $8. That's what I was like, forget it. I ordered it on eBay, got it the next day or so, put it in, I was done. You know, Memory is dirt cheap today. To me, that's utterly amazing. You're talking to a guy who started off with a tape drive on a Commodore 64, and that's literally a cassette tape where data was recorded. So there's there's actually a, a you go to load a program and it'll say press play on tape, and you press play, and it might load the program. Most of the time, it failed. Okay. So anyway, it's unbelievable to me how much memory things have today and how cheap it is. 
Now, one important thing is because we use the binary system or on-off switches, 1K is not 1,000, okay? It's 1,024. Now, that's just a byproduct of the base two numbering system. So if you ever had an older computer where the black screen came on and it started counting up and testing memory, remember that? You notice it was in certain increments. Did you ever notice that? It was in base two increments. And so you wouldn't have a, um, most of the time you wouldn't have a, a six megabyte memory. You'd have eight or four, right? You wouldn't have a, a 31 megabyte DIMM, you'd have 32. It's all base two stuff. So anyway, one kilobyte, uh, and, and you have to be careful because there's a difference between, I think it's in computer science, an uppercase K versus a lowercase K. And one actually means 1,000 and the other means 1,024. I think it's the uppercase K that's 1024 and the lowercase K kind of give a nod to the sciences, right, where a kilo means 1,000. Anyway. Now, the amount of memory required just depends on how many I.O. points you need because each I.O. point requires one bit of memory, which is practically nothing, so it's almost not worth talking about. More important is the size of the program you're going to write. The longer the program, the more memory you're going to need. Um, also, if you need to collect data over time, you're going to need more memory to store that data. And so that's another thing. But also supervisory functions, which is where you're talking to the PLC, and then also future expansion for more uh, complicated programs. These are things that determine the amount of memory, but most people today don't really think about how much memory a PLC comes with until they realize they're out, okay, until they realize their program's too big to fit on the PLC, which does happen, and at that point then they start thinking about it. But um, typically what you have to do, you can't just add another memory module in it. That's not completely true. Some PLCs you can now, okay? Because again, memory's so cheap, you might as well just piggyback off of the computer architecture, right, and just plug in a new DIMM and have more memory. Um, but in the past, you had to buy a different PLC brain in order to um, expand the memory. Now, the instruction set is something we're going to get into a little bit later, but these are instructions that are very commonly used. And I, I left this in because there's one thing I want to say about this. When I, show, when I ask you to make a sealing circuit in your PLC, what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring in Logix Pro, which I've told you guys about, and I'm going to make one here, but in that simulated environment. And then I'm going to ask you to do it in the real world environment. You will have to integrate the idea of how do I program, which I've shown you, with how do I wire things up, which is what I'm about to show you. I'm going to show you what syncing and sourcing means, because it's really important. And of course, I'll help you along the way, but I thought it would be a good idea, and I'd like your feedback on this, to show you PLC program both in the click Coyo variation or syntax and automation direct, not automation direct, Allen Bradley or Rockwell automation at the same time. You'll end up using Logix Pro as well. And they're actually very similar. And once you start to recognize them, it'll make more sense. I, I hope this will work well because the latter logic, no matter where, what flavor you look at it in, it's usually pretty doggone similar. And that's what I hope you get out of this, is the similarities and the basic commands that are needed. But here's some of the basic things. These are examine instructions. They're instructions that are, deal with inputs, whether an input is on or off. These are output things, things that turn on or off different bits that your program must control. And there's timer and counter instructions as well. So we'll look at those, but not right now. I just wanted to mention that before I forgot it. Questions, comments so far? Are we doing OK? Well, this is kind of boring stuff without any direct application. Um, okay, so we've gone through all of this learning module. If we go back to the course page, you'll notice there is yet another learning module called Input, Output, Modules, and Wiring. Uh, we're going to start off with, in fact, we'll probably only go through the first couple of slides because I know that you guys won't absorb all of this and, or even understand why it's important. But I'm going to tell you once, and then in the context of the lab, hopefully you'll, it'll all come together and you'll understand all of this. Okay. So let's talk about memory design. And the reason I want to show you this is because it, it's a nice logical step from where we were to, to where we're going. And it'll give you some insight about how these things work. So um, the MicroLogix 1000 that I passed around has 1K of memory. I don't remember how much we gave for those, but I'd rather have the money now than the PLC. So if you're in the market for a PLC, I've got some good used ones for sale if you're interested, okay? Uh, no, I wouldn't wish those upon anyone. 
Uh, slick 500s typically have 64K. That's how much memory my Commodore 64 had back in the 80s. Okay, and yet it's an industrial PLC. Control Logics, uh, 2 to 32 megabytes of memory and can have up to 128,000 inputs and outputs. Now, obviously, how much program there is determines how much memory you need. Okay, so um, anyway, that's just piggybacking on what we were talking about before. Now, memory locations are very important, and I'll show you why here in just a second. But a memory location is broken up into words and bytes. Now, I don't know why, but computer terminology, I guess, developed organically. I don't know how people came up with this, but a byte is a B-Y-T-E, and it consists of eight bits. Do you know what a bit is? A bit is a shortening for a binary digit. It's a digit that's on or off. It's binary. It's one or zero, okay? So a bit is a binary digit. Here's a binary digit. It can be on or it can be off. It's one thing. It's a bit in memory somewhere, okay? A byte is eight of those bits together. They're usually related. They're in one address. As a matter of fact, at one address is usually a whole word of data. If you're dealing with an eight-bit processor, then the address is eight bits. If you're dealing with a 16-bit processor, which is more common, then it's 16 bits is one address, okay? And so 16-bit memory just means you got 16 bits to make a word. 8 bits is still a byte. Now, bytes sound like they're hungry to me. Okay, bits sound like something really small. Guess what 4 bits is called? Anybody know? It's a nibble. That's right. <laughs> Nibbles and bytes. Okay. You don't usually address 4 bits at a time. 4 bits is pretty small, and usually that is not, I don't know of any 4-bit processors out there. They probably existed at one point. They're not common anymore. Even my Commodore 64 was an 8-bit processor. My Amiga was a 16-bit processor. The computer sitting in front of you is a 64-bit processor. It's just the way things go. Okay. But the point is that all of the your program, all of the inputs and outputs, they're all stored in memory as a bunch of bits. Now here's what's really interesting. Remember we've been talking a lot about inputs and outputs. When you wire up an input, say a switch, it's either open or closed, it doesn't matter, you wire it up to its own input point on an input card, that directly controls a bit in memory somewhere. You don't have to worry about where it is, you do have to figure out how to address it, but I'll show you all that. The point is, there's one bit in memory that's associated with that input point. And when this switch is on, that bit will turn on. When the switch is off, in other words, this is normally closed, so when you press it, that bit will go to zero. And by looking at that bit, you can tell whether that switch is on or off, okay? And using that information, then you can write a program that responds to those inputs, okay? Now, here's a program that is looking at particular bits in memory. It's looking at input one slash one. Now, the terminology in, uh, uh, and click Coyo is a little bit different than this. So we're going to go, kind of go two different ways. Remember I showed you how we had X's for inputs. X, what was it, 001 was the first input. It turns out X101 would be a separate input, but on a separate module in click Coyo speak. Okay? In Allen Bradley or Rockwell Automation, the way you reference a particular input is by the word number and then the bit number. So I stands for input, and then 1 is word 1, and the slash one is bit one. So for example, if we were to look at the memory that has all the inputs in it, here's word one, here's bit one. Notice we skipped bit zero. There's also an I colon one slash zero, but we're not pointing to that because that's not the input we're interested. We're interested in the input that's wired to point one on the PLC input, you see. So right now, this is a normally closed push button. You see that the button is closed. This, though, is not the switch. Students get confused all the time because they think this switch is this, because, because that's how I introduce it, right? I introduce a switch as a set of contacts. But that's not exactly what it is. This is actually an instruction that is referencing the address where the switch is connected. So all it's doing is it's saying, hey, I'm going to go get this bit, and if the bit is 1, I'm going to pass power. If the bit is 0, I will not pass power. That's what the instruction does. Same thing as this one. This one is I colon 1 slash 8. So what word are we talking about? Still word 1, 
right? So it's still the same word. What bit are we talking about? Bit 8. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It's that bit right there. That's the bit that is connected to this switch right here. Since the switch is open, it's a zero, so this is not passing power and doesn't pass power to this output. Another thing is that these memory addresses here, or these output coils, we normally like to think of those <coughs> as coils on relays, but now they're not. Now, in the context of a program, these are outputs that are either on or off. In fact, O colon 2 slash 7 would be the output <coughs> on word 2, which is module 2 right here, and bit. Seven. You see? Now it's really common for it to be set up this way, although ClickCoyo is not, but Alan Bradley and Rockwell Automation is. Do you notice that word zero is blank? And word two is blank, and word four is blank. It's the odd words that actually have bits shown. You know why? Because this actual segment of memory, there is no I colon zero. That's actually a separate card or a separate module. That's a module over here that we're not using. Notice we are using module 2, or word 2. So actually, this word is not even an input word at all. In fact, it's an output word. So this each slot basically corresponds to each 16-bit memory location, at least for the input and output table. Once you get to the program where you're writing programs and you're, you're doing all this, this is stored in other parts of memory. It's stored in program memory. So similarly, all the PLC is really doing when it computes, it looks at the inputs, does all the logic you've made for your program, and either sets or clears outputs, all it's doing is turning on and off bits. And those bits are wired to each output point, and therefore either make contact or don't make contact to turn on or off the device, you see? So there are literal bits in memory that correspond the outputs and bits that correspond to the inputs. You'll notice there is no output zero at all. Word zero is not being used here. Word zero is often reserved for the PLC, the processor slot itself, and that's one of the reasons it's not here, at least in Rockwell. But you'll notice that word two, <coughs> word four, and so forth are being used here as output words. Any questions on all that? I know I'm throwing a lot at you. I think one more set of slides, and we should be good to go on uh, I think we can save the last two presentations for next time. Is that what I wanted? This is not the one I wanted. I'm wrong. I'll have to go through two more sets of slides at least. Yeah, this rehashes a lot of what we just said, but it's, it's worth saying one more time. So we'll, we'll go through this one a little bit more quickly. So the input-output section is the part that allows us to connect to field devices, things like inputs and outputs. Um, these are built into a fixed PLC, but in modular PLCs you can add or subtract from them. Um, a rack-based system has modules that are I.O. modules that you can add to or subtract from or change out. One really nice thing about a rack PLC is that if there's a problem on one of the cards, what you can do is you can actually take that card out and put another one in, reconnect the wiring, turn the PLC back on and keep going. One of the very important things in PLCs is the ability to repair it because things are going to break. And if you've got a machine that's the core of your company making value for that company, you don't want that machine down. You want it constantly producing. And so if there's a, a brain, which is the PLC, which controls that unit, you want to be able to switch out things as necessary to keep the PLC up and running. So that's a really nice feature. As a matter of fact, sorry for those of you on the camera, I'll try to speak lo loudly enough. Uh, actually, let me do it this way. Let me pull this over here. I want to show you guys some features of a rack mounted PLC. And probably the best way to do it is just roll some over. So if you guys want to, you're welcome to stand up and come up here so you can see it a little better. And move it here for the sake of the camera. So we've got some PLC 5s here, and that's about as far back as I think I can get it to still be on the screen. And let's see, we can see some of these. Sorry for the camera. We've got a couple different PLC files, so you can't see the whole thing of either one, but here it is. So 
we've got this module here. Now here's something really interesting. This is an AC output module. So this is a module that, out, that can output, let's see, 120, 12 to 120 volts AC. Now let's say that we were having a problem with, with this module and we wanted to replace it. If we've got, let's see, zero through, uh, let's see, this goes from 00, zero to zero 07, and then, then it jumps to 10 zero through 17. You might wonder why that is. It has to do with the fact that this is counting in octal, but we'll talk about that a little later as well. Basically, there's 8 plus 8. This is a 16 output card. Let's say that for some reason this output card blew up. It doesn't work anymore. The program is still over here in the brain. All we have to do, would you want to disconnect 16 wires plus some commons and then figure out how to put them back? Of course not. So here's what you do. Check this out. This is very common for PLCs to be designed where the terminal block for the wiring just comes away and you can simply remove the entire can remove the entire module, slip it out and replace it. There we go. So this is an output module. All I gotta do if it's broken, just take it out, throw it away, put another one in. Right? So this is the new one now. Just put the new one in. Put it in place. I can do that. Let's try to click it into place with the tab in the right orientation. And then my wiring consists of that, and I'm done, which is really nice. Okay, if you notice, if you look at your PLCs, your click coils, do you notice that little strip of gray? You can actually pull those out. And so your wires are screwed into that and tightened down. You don't have to take your wires out, you just pull that plug out put a new module on, plug it in, and away we go. It's a really nice feature that's very common in PLCs, even the cheap PLCs we have. Obviously, you don't have that advantage when you have a brick PLC. If you have a brick PLC, you have to literally unscrew each terminal, pull the wires out, put the new PLC in place, and continue. So it's not as maintenance-friendly a design as this. Of course, as I said, this is a backplane PLC. You'll see we've got an open slot here, an open slot here. Actually, two open slots here. It's like we've got about three, four slots some of these are inputs. These are AC 120 volt inputs. These are AC 120 volt outputs. There's also an analog input and output. We'll talk more about those later and what that means. But basically, it means that instead of wiring up things that are either on and off, these are things like pressure and temperature and things like that that we could wire up and sense a range of values on each terminal rather than a simple on or off signal. Okay. Any questions about this? These are actually really old PLCs. PLCs 5s are not real common anymore. Um, they're not super valuable. In fact, these are basically junk by comparison to the Click Coyo Zeo. Uh, back in the day, this would have cost a pretty penny. Each one of these would have cost quite a bit, as well as the software to program them. But you'll notice they use a, uh, a serial interface to program. You guys may not even know what a serial interface is. You think USB is universal. Do you know what, anybody know what USB stands for? I'm curious. Universal yeah, Serial Bus? Universal Serial Bus. Excellent. Somebody knows. <laughs> It's, so it's, it's a serial communication protocol that's a heck of a lot faster than the old standard DB9 uh, RS-232 communication ports. So anyway, let me get this out of the way and we will continue. Someone has put a magnet on the side of this of a rugged circuits mega. So, so this is an Arduino, an Arduino mega that's ruggedized. And I think, they're, I think it's kind of a joke because this thing would have 10 times more power than any one of those. And also be relatively easy to wire up IO to. Although, uh, the, even though it's a rugged Duino, which is the name of the company, is, is uh, rugged circuits, uh, it still wouldn't be as ruggedized as these PLCs are. These PLCs are designed so they work in dusty, dirty, hot, cold environments and just, just work. Um, anyway. So let's see. We've already talked about all of this. What else? Here's something that's really interesting and useful. Remote I.O. Uh, is something that is very important. If you think about, and we should, well, some of you may have, I don't think any of you did. Did any of you go on the tour? It's been a couple years now. Uh, it was uh, American Synthetic Rubber Company. Anybody take that tour? It was with SME. It was a cold day between a fall and spring semester. It was miserable. But I went on the tour with the group and then kind of wished I hadn't. I mean, it was nice. They actually gave us a really nice lunch, which was very kind and generous of them. 
but we walked outside most of the day and it was well below freezing. So anyway, American Synthetic Rubber Company is a company out in the west end of Louisville that makes synthetic rubber. So they supply rubber primarily for Cooper Tire or Michelin Tires, I think it was. Because they had a picture of the Michelin Man there. That's their main customer. And they make synthetic rubber. So they bring in tank cars full of chemicals. They react those chemicals together in a very particular process and make synthetic rubber. Of course, this is a process that is absolutely huge. I mean, the, the campus we have here and all the grounds we have, that's about how much space there probably